Good morning, everybody. I hope you had a beautiful holiday. It's nice to be back. I missed everybody. Um, we have some dedications today. Um, we'd like to learn in memory of Leah Bat Miriam, Mrs. Leah Abadi. Also, um, Yeshaya Ben Laura, Mr. Charlie Saka, Alav HaShalom, a real trailblazer, a legend in our community. Um, for the Refuah of Rachel Bat Leah, Rachel Sara Bat Camila, Yafa Esther Bat Rachel. Um, we also uh, are learning in honor of Shirley and Michael Carey um, for their kindness and generosity. Um, I received a text today from my friend Ruth Lazar and uh, it is Yom HaShoah, so I would like to incorporate that into our learning today. Um, and it said, if we held a moment of silence for every victim of the Holocaust, we'd be silent for 11 and a half years. Um, I also would like to dedicate our learning today to elevate the precious souls of the innocent victims that perished um, most of them were really heartlessly murdered, and it's something that um, we need to uh, acknowledge. Um, there is a, a world that needs healing, a world needs a repair, and that's what we're here to do in our own little small way today. Um, we're going to try and um, bring the neshamot of those who have gone um, closer to their place with Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Leah, and Tzadikim together in Gan Eden. Um, we'll start today in Parashat Acharemot, and I think it very much speaks to the Yom HaShoah, because what's being remembered uh, are the souls that have passed. And what's being asked of those who, uh, of us who are here today is to have the courage to be able to start new. As a matter of fact, when the Knesset designated this to be the day of remembrance for the Jews that perished in the Holocaust, they named it Yom HaShoah Ve Hagevura. It wasn't just the Holocaust, the day of devastation, but it's also the day of Gevura. Gevura is a type of strength. It's not only a physical strength, Ezehu Gibor, who is the strong one, who has the real strength and the real courage. There is going to be an element that's required for the living. So if the Shoah is to commemorate those who, have, who we've lost, uh, the Givura could be speaking to the courage that they showed, but it also, I think, is speaking to those of us today who need to demonstrate um, this courage to pick up, to start new. And that's what Aharon is going to have to do in Parashat Acharemot. So I should probably give you, we haven't been learning together for a few weeks, so I should probably just give you a little bit of a background this parasha, Aharemot, seems to be out of context because the sons of Aharon had perished already when the Mishkan was being dedicated. They brought that Esh Zara and the fire consumed them. But here, a few chapters later, our parasha starts with Vaidaber Hashem el Moshe. Hashem is speaking to Moshe after the death of the two sons of Aharon when they came close to God, either they came close to God or they sacrificed before God, and they died. And one of the things that maybe we should be thinking about today, since it is Yom HaShoah, is that Aharon had a choice to make. You know, we know people who have um, fathers, uncles, brothers that serve in the army or 
our policemen or firemen. And sometimes in the line of duty, there are tragedies. And one of the things that we really should recognize is that it takes a certain courage to continue in that same line, in that same work, after having had a loved one perish. I don't know that we think about this enough, how, you know, we often say, why is it that Aharon gets to be the Kohen? He uh, did the, was involved with the Chet HaEgel. Why do we want him to be our representative? But I think today, looking at Aharon under the prism of having lost two sons in the line of Kohanot, Kohanut duty, would make it very difficult for somebody to want to continue this same line of work. And Adon's going to demonstrate for us that we often have choices. We could either choose to be victims of the circumstances and of our history, or we could choose to live a life of uh, heroism and honor and continue and build the legacy and pick up where these lives and these souls left off and do the work that they couldn't do and be the voices that they could no longer speak. And I think that might give a beautiful meaning to this day, Shoah Veha Gevura. There takes, there is a tremendous amount of strength um, necessary, not only for Aharon, but for anybody who has to continue on, especially after a premature uh, death of a loved one. And so since Parashat Acheremot seems to be out of place here, maybe we should take a minute to rewind and start to track the journey of the Jewish people since they left Mitzrayim. And then maybe we can get a better sense of uh, the Parasha and the time period that we're in. So we, from the minute we left Egypt, we started journeying towards this thing that I'm going to call a spiritual relationship with God. We left Mitzrayim on a wing and a prayer, literally, and God has held our hand every single step of the way. We get to Har Sinai, another experience of spirituality, of connecting with God, and this trek, this voyage, is the one that we've been on up until now. Parashat Acharemot is going to be a, a pivotal moment. It's going to be a moment where we're going to pivot from who we were as a nation up until now to who we are going to become moving forward. So when we advance from Sinai and we build the Mishkan and we learned about all the services of the Beit HaMikdash, the star of the show, or maybe there were two stars of the show, were Moshe and Aharon. Moshe was the one that was guiding us and involved in many of the facets of the Beit HaMikdash. And then Aharon is going to come and step up to the plate and also handle a lot of this holiness, a lot of this spirituality, a lot of this connection with God. <clears throat> but in this week's parasha, we're going to see something interesting. And we're going to see that no longer is it going to be <clears throat> all about Moshe and all about Aharon. And we're just along for the ride. Starting in Parashat Aharemot, I'd like you to see uh, in chapter 18, for instance, you're in the stone edition of Hashim, it, you would find it on page um, 648. Chapter 18 starts with Hashem speaking to Moshe and saying, Daber el b'nei Israel. It's time for you to speak directly to b'nei Israel, And I want you to tell them I am God, Hashem, their God. And then he puts this verse, and I think this pasuk depicts for us what the entire perasha, the orientation of the perasha. It says, Whatever they did 
in Egypt or whatever the Egyptians behavior was, that place where you dwell, in English, we would say, leave Mitzrayim behind, leave it in the past. I'm sorry. The land of Egypt where you lived, don't do that. And then it says, and according to the behaviors, the cultures, the um, environment that you're going to find in Eretz Kena'an, that I'm bringing you there, also, don't do that. Don't follow their ways. We're at a threshold here. And if we turn around, we see Mitzrayim in our rear view mirror. And if we look forward through the windshield, we're seeing Eretz Kena'an. And God is telling us in this Pasuk, you don't want to go back to where the culture was one of the Egyptian uh, um, practices. And you also don't want to adopt what the Kena'anim are practicing. You're straddling right now these two civilizations, but I have you here in no man's land. I have you here in the middle of the desert because first you have to create and understand and um, absorb and embrace your own culture, your own laws, your Elohei Avraham, Elohei Yitzchak, Elohei Yaakov, you have your own heritage. What happens when we go to countries that we're hosted by, we very often adopt and adapt their cultures. Now in the desert, there's nobody but us and God. And here in Parashat Acharemot, the the switch over, the transition is from Moshe and Aharon telling all this to us to our being able to absorb this for ourselves. And why this, I brought you to this pasuk, besides that it's the threshold, Moshe and Aharon are going to be connected to the Mitzrayim component of it. They're not going into Kena'an. They're not going to be part of your future physically, of course, spiritually, they are going to always, their teachings till today will always remain with us. But here, this parasha, parashat acharemot, is giving us this, uh, um, this sense, this placement. And what happens here, because we're learning it, and we're going to see that a lot of the parasha deals with a Yom Kippur and the Sele Ola and the Sele Azalzel and the sanctity of life and the sanctity of uh, blood and the sanctity of the land and how we have to behave. But here, with Aharon still being at the forefront, he's our um, poster boy. He's the one who we are looking at. What we really have to recognize is that what Aharon had to contemplate is the very same thing that we have to contemplate today. And we have to contemplate, or we have to be able to blend a notion of the sanctity of life and a life of sanctity. The sanctity of life, how many lives were lost, and a life of sanctity means what are we going to do? How are we going to move forward? How are we going to pick up the pieces? How are we going to show the givudah portion of the Yom HaShoah? You know, we see this also with uh, Naomi. She loses her husband. She loses her two sons. Ruth loses her husband, her brother-in-law, her future. She loses her past. I mean, we, we have so much loss around these weeks and around these months that are the Omer. And I think what the Omer is about, this time period that we're in, this movement from being victims in Egypt to being a kingdom of priests, 
this this whole movement is where we are right now today, this uh, um, transition, this progression from Pesach to Shavuot, all holds within it one theme. So I'd like to start by saying, if we consider Moshe Rabbeinu, for instance, he is, I would think, the person most synonymous with the Passover holiday. Moshe Rabbeinu is from the tribe of Levi. We know the Leviim, once they moved into the land, they became the teachers. They were the ones that didn't have a specific um, portion in the land. And they went and taught the different tribes. They traveled from tribe to tribe around the country throughout the year. They were the teachers. Um, Moshe himself was the one who was the hand holder. He literally held us by the hand. And most of what he was teaching us was in theory, when you come to the land, when you plow your land, if this should happen, if that should happen. And in his leadership role, one of the words that comes to mind was, Hashem yilachem lachem ve'atem tacharishon. God is going to fight your battles. We saw that with Moshe. God brought the plagues. God splits the sea. God gives us the man. God takes care of our every needs. In the modality of the leadership of Moshe, we find ourselves in a place of being recipients and not having to really um, go out there and fend for ourselves. We're going to be moving away from that. This Omer period is to move us away from the notion that everything needs to be done for us to a place where we recognize that we have to take the reins, that we have to start to take control of the wheel. We have to drive our own destiny. And so if we wanted to think about Shavuot, because that's where we're headed towards, I'd like to highlight one particular hero that comes to mind, I mean, you could definitely think David HaMelech, and I would agree with you. Um, I was going to say originally Boaz. I want to say there's a shift from Levi to Yehuda. You know, there's a progression. Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda. We are progressing from the Levi modality, from the Moshe modality, to the Yehuda modality. And what is that Yehuda modality? I think it's very nicely represented with Boaz from the tribe of Yehuda. His uh, claim to fame is that he is going to take action. He is going to be an initiator. He's going to take responsibility. He takes responsibility for root, for the widowed wife of his kinsman. And the word that most comes to mind from Yehuda is eravon. He had told his father, anochi ervenu. I will take responsibility at the time to bring Yehuda, I mean, to bring Binyamin to Egypt and return him home safely. He says, anochi ervenu. I will be not just responsible, I will be the collateral. This idea of an eravon, of taking responsibility, is really where I believe the verses of the parasha are taking us and the movement of the counting our omed is taking us. And so the question is, how do we graduate from the theory of all of this to the practice? How do we take all of the sanctity that we've learned from the Mikdash. And that's what we've been talking about for the past bunch of parshiot was the sanctity of the Mikdash and its vessels and its practices and its um, sacrifices and the performances that we make there. But how do we take all of that and bring it into the real world, into real life application. So I think what's beautiful, if you'll turn to, um, in, the, in our books is page 1022, I will tell you a pasuk and a um, chapter in a second. 
in the book of Devarim, at the end of, chap of Parashat Re'eh, it's chapter 16, verse 9. I think the way that the um, Torah describes the counting of the Omer is going to be a huge um, source for us to understand this progression, the progression from Pesach to Shavuot, from being victims to being kings. And like we had said, I don't want from victimhood to honor, to heroism, from Shoah to Givura. How do we make that transition? How do we go from one uh, um, state of being to the other? So I happen to think this Pasuk is beautiful. It's going to go up there with one of my favorite Pesukim. Um, let's look at how the Torah describes Sefirat HaOmer. It says, Shiva Shavuot Tispor Lach, seven weeks count for yourself, Me'achel Chermesh Bakama, from the time that the sickle is put to the stalk, we're talking about the barley, Tachel Lispor, you should start counting, Shiva Shavuot, seven weeks. We can't take this pasuk and just move on. There is so much glaring. I wish we had a smart board so that I could show you, but I'll try and depict it with words. If you'll notice, our pasuk starts with the words Shiva Shavuot and ends with the words Shiva Shavuot. And as we come closer, after the, those two words, we have the word tispor. And before the end of the pasuk, we have lispor. And then in the middle, we have mehachel and tachel. This is a beautifully structured chiastic pasuk, starting with the sheva shavuot on the outer edges, moving towards center with the tispor, the counting, and moving closer towards center, the hachel tachel, the beginnings, the new beginnings. Basically, the Torah is saying that in counting the seven weeks, you will create for yourselves a new beginning. You will be able to um, start new. What is this, first of all, is so much here, I don't know where to start, so I'll say this. You take out the Shiva Shavuot from the beginning and the Shiva Shavuot, the word Shavua has the word Sheva in it. So we already have the number seven, four times in the two words at the beginning of the Pasuk and in the two words at the end of the Pasuk. We have Sheva, 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 Sheva. And then if you count the number of words right in the middle of the verse, of course, of course, we're going to have another seven words. And I don't think that these verses are written haphazardly. I think these, the pasuk is demonstrating for us, the form is going to follow the function of the pasuk. And what the pasuk wants to tell us is, let, let's first talk about this word tispor, sefirat ha'omed. What is a sefira anyway? I heard in one class, I asked the question and one woman said, oh, safir, like a sapphire. And it happens to be a beautiful um, association because when B'nai Israel were able to um, process or encounter Hashem and see him, what they saw was kilivnat hasafir. It looked like brickwork of sapphire. So if you wanted to play with that here and say that sefirat ha'omed is a way for us to see God again, is a way for us to get a glimpse of the safir, of the sapphire, of the time where there was no barrier between us and God, I think it works very beautifully in the Pasuk. But just simply, grammatically speaking, a few things. First of all, it says, Tispor Lach. 
I like to say that it's written in the feminine. It doesn't say, say tispor lecha, it says lach. And I, I don't know, but the Sephardim, we don't count, the women don't count the Omer. It's a mitzvah aseh that's time bound. So we don't make a beracha for those uh, situations. Um, but if you looked at the word tispor, and we defined it as a sipur, tell a story, tell, give an accounting. The word means really to count, this pod is to count. But how do we count? By giving an accounting, by telling a story, by writing a book, a sefer. And it's very beautiful that it's the women that are the first ones to interact with their children at the youngest of age. And it's the women, it's Torat Imecha, it's the women who are going to tell children who they are, where they came from, who their parents are, what we stand for at the youngest ages, sometimes even before they could read or write, children are going to glean from their mothers an idea, a sense of their self. And this tispor, this sefer, this uh, uh, story that they're going to absorb is going to be um, very, very um, important to their development. I do this a lot, so why not do it today? If we went to the first place that we see this verb, sefer or sipur, counting or book or accounting or retelling or being accountable, which is a very big part. The word, the English language is generous with us because it allows us to uh, manipulate the word to get a stronger sense of it. But do you know where the first place that this word sefed actually appears? It's in Bereshit chapter five, Hasuk one. If you have a Fumash and you'd like to see it, that would be great. I'll read it for you. And it says, Zesefer Toldot Adam. This is, I, I know I just dropped the pin in chapter five of Bereshit, which is not unusual for me, but I want you to know that by the time we see this word, Zesefer Toldot Adam, this is the book of the generations or of the um, birthing of man on the day that God made Adam and he made him in the image of God. I have to press the pause button because there's so much to say here. First, we want to say, this is the third telling of creation. We had our the third telling of the creation of man. So by the time we get to Ele Toldot, by the time we get to this third Toldot, we have to ask ourselves what happened with the other two Toldot. And we'll notice very beautifully, the first Toldot, if you'll turn to um, here, Ele Toldot. When man is first created and God says, Naase Adam betsalmenu kidmutenu, when God first is going to create man uh, in his likeness, what does it say? I'm trying to find the Pasuk by Ibrahim Adam betsalmo. Where is that Pasuk? Oh, here it is. Go to chapter one. Verse 27, it's not coincidental that the pasuk that describes the counting of the Omer should be written chiastically with the Sheva Shavuot, the Lispors, and the Hachels, three words all coming towards center as if they're looking in the mirror. It's no coincidence that that form, that format is used there because it's intended to bring us to the first place that that 
form was employed. That chiastic structure first happens here where Vayivra Elohim et ha'adam betsalmo, God is going to create man in his image. And then we have betselem Elohim bara oto. In his image, he created them. We have Vayivra and bara on the outers. And as we come towards center, we have Elohim and Elohim. And as we come closer to center, we have betsalmo and betselem in his image. What these verses are telling us, again, the Torah doesn't have all of the emojis and all of the techniques where confetti could come out of a pasuk or, you know, any of these, they, they could, this is it. Everything is black ink on white parchment. All the letters have to be the same size, the same font, the same bolded. Nobody's allowed to get underlined. And for the Torah to make a point that Sefirat HaOmed is very closely connected to the creation of man, and we're going to call it Tispor, it could have used the word Timnot or Naso, we have other words that the Torah uses with counting, but it's going to use the word of a sefer. It wants us to take us back to Sefer HaAdam. It's saying that counting the Yomed is about writing your own book. It's about knowing your history. It's about knowing where you came from, knowing how you were created, why you were created, and what to do with that information in order to author the rest of your own story. And if we start to see that comparison, then we will understand that God had created us originally, first and foremost, and he gave us a sefer toldot ha'adam. There are three adams that are created for a purpose. The first adam, the first time it tells about the creation of adam, we could see it as God being completely in control and dictating what he can, what he can't do. We didn't have much autonomy. We were still in the Pesach state. We were still just following orders. We were being told what to do. We weren't supposed to think for ourselves. And as we progressed to the second telling of Adam, which takes place in chapter two, verse four, Ele toldot hashamayim vehaaretz. And in that same, in verse seven, it says, Vayitzer Elohim et ha'adam. Man is recreated a second time. He was created in chapter one. Now he's created in chapter two again. Is it the same man and the same creation? Clearly not. By the second creation, we see the huge shift and we see it specifically in verse four of chapter two, where the God had created the world from Shamayim to Aretz, and by verse four, the world is being asot, is being made from Aretz to Shamayim. The orientation, the energies from above to below that created the first man, in the telling of the second creation of man, those energies are now flowing from below to above. This idea of Aretz to Shamayim, this idea that we are being created from the Adama. So I want to get this understanding that Sefirat HaOmed is a progression. And where we're going to go, I know we stop counting the 49th day and then the 50th day is Shavuot. But what's happening along the way, what happens to Adam and his creation, what happens to the Jewish people in their journey from Mitzrayim to Eretz Israel, what's happening to us today from day one of the Omer to day 49 of the Omer, it's all part of the same story. It requires an awareness, not just how Adam was created initially, and what his purpose was, 
And yes, initially he was created to be a servant and answer to everything God says. But as he moved forward, he was able to think for himself. And as we move even further, there's going to be a sense of what we might think is an autonomy where we are our own bosses and we are our own kings. And it's not just about being free to do what we want. It's as Rabbi Sachs always used to write, it's free to do what we ought, what we ought to do. This telling happens to be very beautiful because it's gonna track our word sefid from sifira. So in the first telling, it's talking about an actual book that we're writing and recording a diary of the creation of man. That same word is the word that God is going to choose in chapter 15 of Bereshit, in verse five, I think this is just so beautiful because it shows the consistency, the purity, the perfection that is Torah. So in verse 15, I'm sorry, in chapter 15, verse five, and since I dropped the pin, I'll give you two seconds to orient yourself with these verses. For those of you who don't have Humashim, this is where God is speaking to Avraham. And he's telling him, I am your magen, I am your shield. You're going to have a lot of sachar. And Avraham asks, what do you mean? I don't even have a child. And God says, don't worry. The, from the one that comes from within you, he's going to be your inheritor. And by verse five, it says, oto He takes him outside. So God is taking Abraham, and we have to start to ourselves picture the um, significance of this. Imagine Abraham is in a tent and all he could see are four walls and he's narrow and he's restricted and he doesn't have a view of the great outdoors. So the first thing he does is he takes him hachutza, he takes him outside and start to picture the Jews in Egypt. They didn't have a scope. They didn't have a frame of reference. All they knew was going from work, from home to work, from work to home, here, God is saying, it's time to step out of your box. If you want to see something greater, if you want to be something greater, then you need to have This is so important. If you want to change your circumstances, don't have don't look down. Don't look at your shoes. Don't look down at the earth. Don't be, you know, a sign of depression as a person is looking down. Don't do that. Habetna hashamayma. Raise your head. Look up towards the heavens. That's where you're going to see that there's something greater than just your physicality. Usifor hakochavim. I brought you to this pasuk because I wanted you to see that the word that God is using for the stars is sephor. Count the um, count the stars. Im That word appears twice. If you could even count them, that's how many your children are going to be. What is God really telling Abraham? We know He's not telling him count the stars because that would be something that's humanly and physically impossible. You can't, no, nobody could count the stars. They're infinite. But what is God telling Abraham? He's telling a few things to him, and I think one of them relates very nicely to the Yom HaShoah. Let me see if I can make this loud. I'm sorry for the background noise. Oh, no. No. Sorry. I'm hoping you could hear me. Linda, could you raise your hand if you could hear me or wave? Okay, good. I'm gonna try and be as loud as I can. There's drilling upstairs, I apologize. I think what God is telling Abraham when he tells him, Sephor HaKochavim in Tuchal, he's telling him, let's go, let's, let's first reference the Yom HaShoah. What are stars? Do stars have their own light? or do they reflect light like the moon? 
stars are actually like suns. They have, they emit their own light. And when are stars best seen? If you're an astronomer, if you have a telescope and you wanna see the furthest nebulae, the furthest, furthest uh, lights in the sky, the optimal time to see them would be when there's no light of the moon to cast any fog or shadow around those lights. If we think about it really clearly, we'll recognize that the new moon, the Rosh Chodesh, is the best time to see the, the stars. That's when their own light is not going to have to, um, is not gonna have to duel or, or fight with the light of the moon. So we start to get a sense here that God is telling Abraham, Sephora Kochavim, as Jews, your children are going to be like the stars. When it's darkest out, that's when their light is going to shine brightest. That's when you're going to most see them in the world. It's a little bit comforting for us today in the time frame that we're living in, in a darkened world, to be able to say, maybe the darkness is an opportunity for us to shine our light even greater. Maybe the darkness is a chance for the furthest and the smallest lights to be uh, illuminating the world. That's what our, that's what our job as Jews are, is. That's the part of the givura, is having the strength amidst the darkness like a star to shine bright because we have our own light. The Jews are not dependent, not on Mitzrayim and not on the Kena'anim. We're not dependent on any culture to give us our light. We have our own inherent light. And this blessing that God is going to give to Abraham is going to say, your children will be able to sephor. When they count the Omer, it will be an opportunity for them to connect with their mission of having been created originally, of sefer toldot Adam, and they'll also be able to connect back to their heritage. They'll be able to connect back to these blessings. They'll be able to see not just the pain of the past. Today we're commemorating, commemorating the pain of the past, but really also there is a lot of beauty in the past. There is a lot of strength in the past. There is a lot that could be learned from the avot, from our trials, from our journeys that we've taken together as a nation. And from there, that's where we should be drawing our uh, givuda. I'd like to take you to one more place that I thought was very interesting that this word should be used, lispod. It's in Bereshit as well. It's chapter 37, verse 9. And for those of you who don't have a Fumash in front of you, I took you into Parashat Vayeshev, chapter 37, verse 9. I took you there. It's the story of Yosef telling his dreams. And I think it's very interesting that when he tells his first dream, the one about the bundles of wheat, it says, Yosef had a dream. Vayomer, Shimuna hachalom. Listen to my dream, he tells them. And he tells them about all the bundles bowing down to his bundle. But when he dreams a second time in verse 9, it says, Vayachalom od, he dreams again. And that time, Vayisaper oto le'echav. The first dream wasn't Vayisaper. The first dream was just he told it to his brothers, but it didn't use that word. Today, now, in this dream of the stars, when he's telling the story that the stars and the sun and the moon are going to come and bow down to him, he's using the word vaisaped. 
because he's saying on another level, sefor, count the stars, the blessing. He's saying that this is prophecy because he uses the word hine over and over. He says, hine chalamti, hine hashemesh. He uses that word over and over. He's saying what Yosef is saying. This is all part of our sefirat ha'omet, our telling the story. The story is being told where we're weaving one piece from the past and bringing it into our present, and then weaving another piece and bringing it. And our collective story as a Jewish people is going to be a tapestry of all our stories woven together. And Yosef is going to choose to use the word Vaisaped. He's going to tell his story. He's going to account for his story by saying, brothers, what I'm telling you is a continuation of what God had told Abraham, which is a continuation of the creation of man. All of this is going to bring us to this idea that Sefirat HaOmed is about achieving a goal, a goal that was set all the way back. It's the essence of why we were, cre we were created originally in Bereshit. It's not just about checking a box. I counted today. Okay, check the box. I'm still in it. Are you in? Are you out? Did you count? Did you miss a day? It's not about that. It's not just about counting days. It's a nice saying that says, don't just count your days. Make your days count. It's about making our days count. And sifira, when we see this term, sifira ta'omed, what is being asked of us? It's being asked of us today. We're counting Sefirat HaOmer today. I'll say this. Since the original leaving of Mitzrayim till today, we're still counting every year the same 49 days from the second night of Pesach all the way to Shavuot. It's the same 49 days for generations now, for millennia already. So what is actually being counted? We're being asked every generation, and I know we sit down to the Seder and we talk about the stories of the past, but what the great rabbis really wanted us to do with the Haggadah is to tell our own story to our children. Yes, tell them about what happened 2,000 years ago and also about what happened 1,000 years ago. But don't forget to tell them what happened 100 years ago about your own parents, about your own grandparents, about what happened last week and yesterday, and how that's all part of their sefer. That's part of how they're being counted. That's part of their sipur. That's part of their story. A few years ago, Betora invited Nancy Spielberg. She had directed a film, and it was, gonna, it was called who will write our history? Very interesting. It was about a group of people. They called themselves the Oneg Shabbat. That was the name of the group. And the idea was that these people were documenting, they were collecting wrappers, posters, pamphlets, newspapers, shoes, anything that they could that would tell a story. They were creating a literary uh, time capsule of the time that they spent in the Warsaw ghetto. And one of the things that she said that was pretty chilling to me was that um, in the same box, in the same memory box that stored a poster, a huge poster about a concert that was being held and where it was being held and the forum and the date and the time, there was also another poster. So that was a poster about the concert. There was another poster about a curfew, the curfew of what time the Jews had to be locked back into their homes. And to see both of these realities at the same time, it was just so uh, 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 chilling. It was, it was a little bit uh, um, uh, scary or eerie. So let's go back to the simpler version of what I believe today our sefirah is taking us towards. So we had said originally it's taking us 
from Pesach to Shavuot, yes. It's taking us from Moshe to Boaz as well, from a place where we were uh, needing to be handheld to a place where we are responsible for ourselves. And once we're responsible for ourselves, we're responsible for others, for our community, for our world as well. It's taking us from a place of being victims to a place of being kings. Now, there's another element, there's another layer that could be folded on top of this Omer time period. It takes us from the time period of the barley to the time period of the wheat, the mincha, the offering that we wave on Pesach is one of barley and the Omer Atenufa, the wave offering on Shavuot is going to be one of wheat. And so too, in this transition, in this movement from slavehood to freedom, from uh, dependency to autonomy, Part of this movement is depicted with the barley and the wheat. So barley is typically known as the food that's fed to the animals. The barley is, was one of the cheapest grains known to man. It was unrefined. It was not something you would ever find on the king's table. It was for the, unfortunately, poor people who couldn't afford a refined grain and for the animals. Today, of course, we might have a totally different view on barley. Today with all the organic and whole grain, barley is considered to be a very, very uh, expensive, by the way, if you wanna buy something whole grain is more expensive today. But back then, the barley, it's, I sometimes, um, liked to reference the um, idea that Shilomo had, Hamelech had written. Um, he said the barley, if the barley had a voice, if the barley had something to say, what would the barley say? He would say, ani. the barley is like the prayer of the poor person. The poor person who is a uh, sheria atof that is constantly swaying, that doesn't have a foundation. You know, the poor person, he's like dust in the wind. He doesn't know where he's gonna wake up tomorrow. He doesn't know where his next meal is gonna come from. The barley is the state that the Jews were in when we first left Egypt. We didn't know what was gonna be. We didn't know what was in front of us. It was very hard for us to have any sense of grounding or security. And the barley is described by King Solomon. It, he says um, that he is, the, the Ashkenazim call it shuk, shuckling. The barley is always waving. And asher yish, What does the barley do? He's constantly pouring out his soul. And he's const, in constant asiyah is a conversation. He's in constant close conversation with God because every step he takes, he's dependent on what God is going to give to him. And that is where we were or where we are at the beginning of the counting of the Omer. And then the genius of King Solomon is he describes the wheat. And he says, what is, what is the wheat saying? If the wheat had a voice, what would he say? And it would surprise us. The wheat says, Mima amakim keraticha Adonai. Hashem, I'm calling you from very far away. The wheat seems to be saying, or King Solomon wants us to understand that the wealthier and the more refined we are and the more secure we are, we're actually the furthest away from God. We're not in constant need. We're not hand to mouth. And so when we call out to God, we're calling out to God from the depths, from the bottom, from the furthest place. And why is this so beautiful? Because King Solomon is saying, when you go from slavehood to kingship, when you go from Pesach to Shavuot, when you go from victimhood to honor, when you make this voyage, when you make the trek, when you come out 
on the other end and you're still in one piece, remember, there's a very big danger, the kohi ve'otzem yadi danger, the danger that when you come out on the other side, you're going to think that it was because of your own doing or because of your own greatness. And that's why King Solomon comes and says, when you get to the place of wheat, when you come to the place of refinement, of stability and security, don't forget keraticha, to call out to God and to recognize that's our most vulnerable state. The place where we think we're strongest physically is actually the place where we are weakest spiritually. Our physical weakness is conducive for spiritual strength. I always think of Tevya from Fiddler on the Roof. The poorer he is, the closer he is to God. The more he needs to count and call out to him at every minute. Sifirat ha'omed. We're counting, we're calling, we're connecting, we're writing a story. The story that we write must have our past. It must, it's the, it has to be complete. The sifira is not complete. If you miss a day, if it's broken, you don't make a beracha anymore. It the omen is only complete when one edge of it is touching Pesach. It's picture yourself with one hand, one finger touching all the way, stretched out, touching Pesach, and your other hand is outstretched in the opposite direction, and it's touching Shavuot. This straddling of Pesach and Shavuot, this completion, this completeness of the Omer being anchored on both sides by Pesach and Shavuot is what's going to anchor us. It's what's going to balance us. It's going to take our story and say, where have I come or where I've come from must be connected to where I'm going. Whether you want to say you come from Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, whether you want to say you came from Mitzrayim, whether you want to say you came from your grandparents, whether you want to come from Aleppo, whether you came from Eastern Europe, wherever it is that you came from, whether it's glory or gory, either one, that has to be connected to where you are going. We cannot cut off parts of our past. We can't cut off the fingers that are touching Egypt from the fingers that are touching Eretz Israel. We are one contiguous unit. We are one complete, unbroken connection from past to future. The future that we want to reach has to be connected to the past. Otherwise, we will be like the wheat in King Solomon, who is so disconnected, who forgot his early days, who forgot how he became who he is. He lost his roots, and therefore he just sank to the bottom, and he became the furthest away from God. Sefirat HaOmed is designed for us ma'alin bakodesh. It's designed so that we elevate. We go from one number and increase and increase because it's not just the numbers that are intended to increase. It's our growth. It's our spirituality. It's our sense of self. It's our knowledge. It's our connection. And it's about going up Yes, and I keep saying it over and over. Ahadon had to pick up the pieces. Ruth had to pick up the pieces. Naomi had to pick up the pieces. Boaz picked up the pieces. Everybody's been picking. Yehuda himself lost two sons. He had to pick up pieces. I mean, we keep coming along, along the journey from the beginning of time. There have been fathers who unfortunately fortunately buried their sons. We're looking at uh, uh, so many right now in our closest history. That is not the norm. That is not derech hateva. That is not the natural way. And the natural way to respond would be to fold 
ourselves up and just collapse and compress and depress and it's over, game over. But Sefirat HaOmer is saying, and it's here with Parashat Acharemot where Aharon is gonna pick up the pieces. And we too, from Egypt, from the Holocaust, from whatever hardships we've been through, we're gonna keep plowing, we're gonna keep moving forward. We're gonna remember that those stars that God had counted, told Abraham he won't be able to count, they shine brightest when it's darkest. That's the opportunity and it's hard to say that such devastation is an opportunity, but God is telling Abraham, your children will find a way. And by God, we've been finding ways. We created a state. We built a country that was dust and turned it into one of the most profitable countries on the planet, not just per capita, the greatest kimitzion, not just tetze Torah. What comes out of the state of Israel in every category is mind boggling. You, what do you want? Medicine, you want music, you want technology. What? Give me a field and I will tell you that Eretz Israel and the people and its inhabitants and the Jewish people, they're at the forefront of everything that makes our world better. We are, as Jews, the stars that God described to Abraham. We're the ones that have our own light that will burn bright despite the darkness. And with this uh, um, charge that we've been given, we're going to bring our past with us. It's not something that's, it's part of who we are. It's part of what makes us a nation to stay together, to keep our strength, to keep our faith. I don't want to stay in the priesthood after losing his two sons. Who does that? For the survivors of the Holocaust to be at the forefront to fight for the state of Israel, how did they have that strength? I, I love that it's called Yom HaShoah, but I way love more that it's called Vehagivura. The Givura is for them, but it's also a charge for us. Let's all be heroes. Let's all be Giborim. Let's all take what we've been given the knocks, the good, and the bad. But let's bring it to the next phase. Let's write our story. Let's tell our story. And in our story, we get to off author the next chapter. Let's all take our pens out. It's the mightiest tool that we could own. And let's write for ourselves a future that is filled with health, with peace, with understanding with tolerance, with joy, with happiness, with the original intent that God had for humanity, let's dig deep and find those ideals once again, and let's start to map a course so that we could navigate our way back to the beautiful ending to the end of the Sheva Shavuot, to the end of the seventh days, we're on that 50th day, the Jubilee, there will be liberty and freedom and happiness and joy. It was the happiest day of the year, the Jubilee, where the English word jubilant comes from the Jubilee. There's nothing greater than having completed a cycle and reaching that last part, but we all know what happens at the Jubilee. Does the 50th year mean that the 49 years or the 50 years are behind us? No, it means tachel. That's where we start our new beginning. That's where once again, everybody has an opportunity. Our chapter talks about the Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the same concept. We are allowed to start clean. We're allowed to start new in the Jubilee, all debts, all slaves. The past is the past and we're going to move future new. But it doesn't mean that we didn't experience the previous years. They're part of us, but they're not gonna dictate where we're moving in the future. 
And that's why the pasuk in this week's parashah, and I'll end with this is, you don't have to stay stuck in Egypt. If your past is a place of pain and immorality, you don't have to be stuck there. And if you're headed towards a place of pain or immorality, like they were in chapter 18, they were headed towards Kena'an, you don't have to fall prey to that. You have a choice. We all do. We can rise to the occasion. We could use our givura, and we could be the lights that are going to cleanse, purify, and make our world once again a happy place and a place where God is going to choose to rest his Shekhinah. I apologize for all the background noise. It was totally beyond my control. I thank you for your patience and for your stamina and for your givura of staying uh, with us um, today.